What's 12 feet tall and eats motorcycles? We'll tell you this week on Motoring 2005. SN's Motoring 2005 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Midas, for mechanics known for their work and their word. Trust the Midas touch. You know, it's no secret that over the past 10 years, the most popular and fastest growing segment in the automotive industry has been SUVs. And of course, manufacturers love it because unlike cars, they actually make money building trucks. But despite their popularity, SUVs have taken a good deal of criticism, even here on motoring. And the biggest knock is simply that they are unsafe. Yet consumers buy SUVs because they're big and therefore they must be safe. Well, you know, 59% of people who die in crashes involving SUVs die as a result of rollovers. In fact, there's even talk that manufacturers may have to put a rollover propensity number right beside the fuel mileage sticker in the showroom. So the question is, are SUVs getting a bad rap? Well, the world's newest truck maker thinks so. This week we're at the George Barber Motorsport Park just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. And this is where Porsche has brought journalists to hopefully dispel the myth that SUVs are unsafe. I think there's a perception out there by a lot of people that SUVs are not safe, but the reality is that they are very safe vehicles in the most common crash modes, front crashes, side crashes, and rear crashes. The thing that people need to be concerned about with SUVs is rollover safety, and to deal with rollover safety, the main thing is to wear your seat belts all the time. It must be designed both for passive and active safety. It must be designed to survive a crash and, and with minimal or no injury to the occupants. At the same time, perhaps more importantly, it must be designed to avoid accidents. And there you have a variety of different uh, technologies in place that really help the driver avoid accidents. If you're buying a new sport utility vehicle, a key thing to look for would be electronic stability control, which is greatly reduces the risk of the rollover crash happening in the first place. Uh, field studies uh, to date have indicated that electronic stability control can reduce the incidence of rollovers by something like 50 or 60 percent. What we're doing here today is giving people the opportunity to experience SUVs in a different manner, not in your typical light, but we're giving them a chance to go out here, find out really how an SUV should handle, to experience the active safety systems, stability management systems, anti-lock brakes, the benefit of a vehicle with a unibody construction, a low center of gravity, independent suspension, proper brakes, the whole package, what you should be looking for in an SUV. Now what we would like to do is demonstrate ABS, the benefits of ABS. We're in a vehicle that has the ABS system disconnected or turned off. What we have here, we're simulating an, uh, an icy condition. So what we'll do is we're going to accelerate up, we'll reach a braking point, I'm going to push very hard on the pedal, and we'll lock the tires up and we'll no notice that I don't have steering control. So off we go. We're accelerating. Okay, and hard on the brakes. Now, look, see, now I'm going to start turning the wheel and the car doesn't change direction when I had my foot on the brake. So now, let's go get in a vehicle that has ABS system connected and see if we can make it through a turn. So, here we go, we'll accelerate. Come to our braking point, now apply the brakes. Notice how with the ABS system, I now have steering control. Was full hard on the brake pedal. The ABS system keeps the tires rolling so we maintain our traction and we have steering control so that we can avoid the obstacle in front of us. You don't you want to have the crash in the first place and that's why you should look for features like electronic stability control and anti-lock brakes, but often crashes are not within your control. You can be driving very safely down the street. Someone can come out of a side street, run a stop sign, run a, 
want to light, you know, run into you. I mean, you've got to have passive safety too. Both of them are equally important. The first word in sport utility is sport. And Porsche is very proud of the performance that we've built into our SUVs, really put the sport into them. But part of the equation, part of that performance equation is also safety. So we're equally proud of the safety innovations that we've incorporated into our Cayenne SUV. Common sense certainly must prevail at all times. You know, the, a vehicle's performance capabilities will make it a safer vehicle. The better it performs, the safer it is. I think that goes without saying. Uh, but still, you've got to use your head out there. Just because the vehicle is quicker, brakes better, corners better, you still have to use good judgment. I keep telling you not to buy SUVs because they're not efficient. So how do I justify a 500 horsepower sedan? Just watch me. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Over its 25-year run and four generations, the Jetta has really only been nipped and tucked. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the fifth-generation Jetta. Now, this thing marks a radical departure from those of the past. The new Jetta is not only much larger, it also looks the part with its shiny sheet metal, large headlights and a new bi-level chrome grille. Now this is VW's new face and so it will appear on many new models. The drawback is that this personality just does not go far enough. Simply it looks like just another Japanese car from the side or rear, which is a real shame. The old car sold, at least in part, because it did not look like a cookie cutter had punched it out. Over the years there have been a number of different vehicles that have used a five-cylinder engine. Audi is probably the most famous. Well, Jetta now joins that long list as this Volkswagen gets a two and a half litre inline five. Now this thing does two things for the Jetta. First of all, it brings plenty of power and secondly, well it brings that unusual and very distinctive noise all five cylinder engines make. The bottom line, you'll love the power, I'm not so sure about the noise. <laughs> Noise aside, the 150 horsepower and 170 pound-feet of torque brings spirited performance as it not only revs to redline, it delivers a true sense of speed, even when mated to the Tiptronic automatic transmission. Now before you start yawning at the thought of a slush o -matic, drive it. This thing is as good as a manual for setting the car up for a corner and much less of a pain when stuck in traffic. In spite of all of this good stuff, however, whether hooked up to the manual or Tiptronic transmissions, the Jetta still takes a leisurely 9.1 seconds to stroll its way to 100 kilometers an hour. You know, it's almost as though Volkswagen took another page out of Audi's playbook when they designed the interior. It really is top-notch and very well laid out. There are, however, a couple of things to complain about, especially after you've paid 3300 bucks to get the leather. You still get a manual back and forth adjuster, a pump action thing to raise and lower the seat, although the backrest is power recline. The other thing, well believe it or not, this thing here is supposed to be the armrest. Just don't go resting on it too hard. The Jetta's fully independent suspension features McPherson struts up front and a new four-link design in back. This setup provides a good balance between comfort and handling. On the highway, the cushioned ride helps the miles melt away. Head for the hills and twisty pavement, or in our case, the skid pad and a line of pylons, well, it really does bring the best out of the Jetta. The response to driver input is fast and predictable, the steering has a crisp feel, and the feedback is reassuring. One of the bigger improvements to this Jetta is the back seat room. Thanks to a 66 millimeter stretch in the wheelbase, while well, you now get plenty of knee room, there's enough space under the seats for your toes. You also get all of the versatility Volkswagen's famous for. To begin with, you get a ski pass through. 
If you need more space yet, well, you just fold down both halves of the 70-30 split folding rear seat. That enlarges an already massive 16 cubic foot trunk. The Jetta also comes with a number of notable electronic aids, along with the anti-lock brakes, which do provide short, straight, fade-free stops, comes a good electronic stability control system. The likeable part is that it does not dive in and power the engine down the instant a wheel begins to stray. Rather, it gives the driver enough latitude to play. So much so, I did not have to turn it off for the pylon test, which is a pleasant change. This fifth generation Jetta is a better car than the four previous generations added together. It handles well, it's got plenty of power, and it now has the space it's always cried out for. When you go up front, well, you'll see nothing but Volkswagen with its new face. When you get back here, unfortunately, all it says is Japanese. Our Midas tip of the week concerns cooling systems. The lightweight aluminum radiators used in modern cars are very efficient, they last quite a long time, and they don't require a whole lot of maintenance. But there's a few things that you should check before you go on a trip in hot weather. First of all, lift the hood and look at the radiator opening. Look at the front of the rad, make sure that there isn't debris on it, bugs or dandelion fluff on the front of it that's matting it up or covering it. If it is, you can get a shop vac and be very careful and pull all that debris off there with a shop vac or you can take it into a rad shop and have them rinse it off there. But you've got to be very careful because the rad core is quite delicate. You can't crunch it with any hard object or you'll damage it. Also, make sure that your coolant is full and clean. Many new cars use Dex Cool coolant, which is good for five years. If your car is older, it may have green coolant that needs to be flushed every three years. But make sure the coolant hasn't gone murky or discolored so that you can't see through it. If it has, it definitely needs flushing. And keep track of when you flushed it last so you'll know when you have to do it next. Have a look at all your hoses. Make sure that they aren't bulged, leaking, or cracked in any way, shape, or form. And think about changing them if it's an older car. Make sure your electric engine fans are working. You should be listening for that periodically, but if you haven't heard them run recently, make sure that you idle the car long enough and watch the temp gauge and make sure that they do cut in when they should cut in. Also, look for any telltale signs of leaks. Make sure there's no puddling underneath the car or stains under any, any hose connection. If you notice anything like that, you've got to get the car in and get it serviced. And make sure you never remove that rad cap if the engine's hot or it's been running. You only take it off when the engine's stone cold. That's your Midas tip of the week. Here in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama, standing in front of the Barber Vintage Motorsports Museum. This is the largest motorcycle museum in the world. We've got 144,000 square feet of beautiful motorcycles here. This is the uh, creation, really, of a Birmingham businessman, George Barber. Uh, it represents the largest philanthropic contribution in the state's history. The collection started as a car collection in uh, 1988. Mr. Barber realized that a, the world's largest or world's best car collection has already been accomplished. So he kind of set his focus on motorcycles. And when we decided on the collection theme, it was just motorcycles as a whole. Uh, we don't focus on a street bike or a race bike. We focus on the motorcycle itself. And we feel we've put together a really unique international representation of motorcycle. We have some celebrity bikes in here, and of course you have the Steve McQueen bike. The Great Escape movie kind of put Steve McQueen on a bike, and that jump was done with an old Thunderbird Triumph. And uh, we have a TRW Triumph, which is a flathead Triumph that was used by the British military. And that's a bike that McQueen owned and rode, and is in very nice original condition. Oh, the Easy Rider bike. Everybody likes the celebrity bikes. Uh, that particular motorcycle became an icon. It was a, uh, basically a B-movie that was done back in the late 60s or 70s and obscure actors which are famous now. Uh, but these were built just as uh, prop bikes. And the machine in there is a replica of the original bikes and there were several of these machines built, uh, the Billy bikes and the Captain America bikes using as prop bikes. And they were stolen or destroyed or lost along the way and uh, this is just one of the replicas of that bike. 
Did you get on most of these bikes and ride out of here? Oh, uh, we're a living museum. Uh, the bikes in the collection do run. Uh, fortunately, with the fire marshal in the city of Birmingham, we can't keep them wet and uh, hot batteries in them all the time, but we do keep a select group of the bikes ready to go. Along with his love of motorcycles, George Barber also has a fascination for sculptures, mind you, of a different ilk. Would you believe motorcycle-eating ants and even giant spiders? And those are just a few of the insects and animals found here at the Barber Motorsport Park just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Brad, I hope you brought the directions to that place because, uh, well, you know motorcycles are my first love, so uh, I'll be there sooner or later. Want to tell you about my driving experience this week with the Corvette. Just fantastic. Talk about a kid in a candy store. I mean, it doesn't get much better, right? The weather was great. Put lots of miles on the Corvette. It was just totally a blast. And last night, to top it off at the gas station, the Corvette's almost out of gas. Around six o'clock, the price had cycled right down to the bottom. I think it was 75.5 for regular. But I try and get into the gas station, huge lineup, can't get near the place, so I keep going. By about 10 o'clock last night, I had to get gas. There was no two ways about it. Went back to the same gas station. There's very little lineup. I pull up to the pumps, and there's a sign on each pump that says, sorry, we're temporarily out of regular, but we're gonna give you super for the price of regular. Now the Corvette has 10.9 to 1 compression, so it has to have 91 octane or super gas. That's what it calls for in the manual. So I get super gas for the price of regular, and they're apologizing for it. Made my day. Anyhow, I want to tell you this week some tips for driving standard transmission cars, and as far as I'm concerned, if you buy a car like the Corvette or any sports car, anything for that matter with a bit of a sporting edge to it, it's got to be a standard. This one's got a fantastic six-speed tranny, and there's lots of other cars with six-speed manuals or five-speed manuals. Just a ton of fun to drive. And, you know, how you drive that standard transmission car will tremendously impact how long your clutch lasts and how long that tranny lasts. So let's talk about some of the do's and don'ts. You know, when you've got 400 horsepower and 400 foot-pounds of torque under your right foot like the C6 Corvette, it's kind of tempting once in a while to juice it. But let's be realistic. If you want your clutch and tranny to last, you've got to be careful what kind of uh, driving you do with that car. Now, when I came into that parking lot, the clutch was fully engaged, and I was using up tires, but I wasn't using up clutch and tranny. The, the key here is when you're pulling away from a dead stop with a car with a standard transmission, Try and launch it with absolutely the bare minimum RPM. In the case of the Corvette, it's got so much torque that pulling away doesn't require any throttle. Just feed the clutch in slowly and progressively and the car pulls away. Don't use the clutch to accelerate the car. Once you've got your foot off the clutch, now you can get your right foot into the throttle and pick the speed up. And that's how you save wear and tear in your clutch. Now in terms of shifting, there's another trick to shifting that'll save wear and tear in your tranny. Now when you, I'm in second gear right now, when I come out of second gear into third, I'm gonna cradle the shifter like this, not grasp it hard, just cradle it. When I come out of second, I'm gonna make a little pause, a little bit of pressure against third gear, and then pop it into third gear. And that little pause that you make before going into the next gear saves wear and tear on the synchros in your tranny. And that can be the difference between the synchros lasting the entire life of the transmission or you having to rebuild the transmission long before it's time. Now you might think it's cool and you see the drag racers ripping it from one gear to the next really fast. Saves time and that's obviously what you do when you're drag racing a car and that's what the guys in the movies do. But believe me, if you want that tranny to last, get in the habit of making that little pause in between gears, little pressure against the next gear and then pop it in and that pause will save you a lot of wear and tear. Now, one thing I really noticed about the Corvette too, fifth and sixth gear are both overdrives in this car. This car gets phenomenal highway fuel economy. You can't believe a 400 horsepower car can get 37 miles per gallon on the highway. It's just unbelievable. Makes it a little bit easier sell when you're trying to talk your other half into that $80,000 car. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2005.
I keep telling you not to drive SUVs because they're inefficient. They waste fuel. So how do I justify a sports sedan like the M5? I mean, do you really need 500 horsepower to drive to work? Well, of course you do. Now, you might think that smacks of hypocrisy. Say it isn't so. But really, there are justifications for a car like this. Number one is progress. Now, we don't really know where progress is going to go. That's what research and development is all about. People think about the German autobahns with no speed limits. They think that's dangerous. But you look at the stronger body structures, better suspensions, better tires, better brakes. That all came out of the German car industry so their customers would live long enough to buy another car. Now, we don't know that where V10 engines are going to go. Do you need a seven-speed gearbox with paddle shifting? Well, maybe not. But maybe the technology that's developed in a car like this will lead to cleaner, more fuel-efficient engines, better transmissions in the future, and that technology will work its way down into lesser automobiles. But there is a second word that justifies a car like this, and it's passion. Listen to this. I rest my case. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, for me, one of the most frustrating trends in today's society is that so many people are not willing to take responsibility for their own actions, but would rather blame somebody else for their own situation. As far as I know, coffee has always been a hot beverage. And if you eat too many cheeseburgers and french fries and you don't exercise, there is that possibility you might put on weight. Well, you know, it's the same in the automotive industry. Earlier I told you that 59% of people who die in a crash involving an SUV, it's the result of a rollover. What I didn't tell you is that over half of those people were not wearing a seat belt. So what do you do? Blame the truck? Well, you know, if you're gonna drive a 450 horsepower Porsche Cayenne Turbo, you should adjust your driving. But as we found out this week, the same technology found in the 911 is also found in the sport unit, and it can save your butt in a tight situation. Now, I know this technology comes at a price, but hey, what price can you put on not only saving your own life, but somebody else's? That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. There are many Saab owners today that are looking for a sport utility vehicle, and we think with this vehicle, we're going to get into their garage. TSN's Motoring 2005 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Midas, for mechanics known for their work and their word. Trust the Midas touch.